Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really, I should say, I always really enjoyed coming to FUSS Backstage and having these sort of more, uh, I should say, meta conversations around open source. And I really hope that this is one of those talks as well, where, you know, on the one hand, you know, I'm trying to give you some kind of quick tips um, just based on all the design work that I've been doing in open source, um, but also maybe in highlighting these, you know, different aspects and maybe blind spots that we've been facing. Uh, this is also a way to enter some of those more, um, well, looking at the systematic questions, right? Look, asking about the structures and the overarching issues. Uh, so this is sort of the, the goal for my session today. Um, but yeah, let's start at the beginning. Who am I? Uh, my name is Eileen. I am a designer in open source. Uh, this is how I feel most of the time when I am in open source. Um, previously, uh, before I you know, called myself a designer, I was a open source and public interest tech advocate um, in Berlin. And previously, previously, you know, my background is actually in mathematical logic and philosophy. So in case you ever wonder where those philosophers end up, this is where they end up. They design in open source. Um, I work for an organization called Simply Secure. Uh, we're a US-based nonprofit. And most of the time we do design research and this sort of coaching. Um, when there is not a pandemic going on, we host events and gatherings. Uh, and of course, in, in doing that, we try to write a lot and develop toolkits, design pattern libraries, videos to help support the community. So this sort of thing where we open source our methodologies uh, is very much in line with what we do. Um, we work with mostly infrastructure funders uh, across the globe. Um, and as Paul has already said, we, we coached a lot of projects. Uh, in the subtitle, it says, uh, over 100 projects. Simply Secure has definitely worked with over 100 projects, I think. These are just some of them. Uh, I, I myself, I counted that recently. I, the number is probably more around 49. Like that's the number of projects I have been directly working with. So all this is to say, like, we have been doing this for a few years now. And we've, you know, come to coachings uh, where basically uh, we, we just sort of like, hey, do you need a designer? What can we do for you? And then projects come to us for help. And in doing so, you know, there are obviously some larger patterns we see. And so today, really, like what I'm trying to think about is what are the frequently asked questions in those coachings? And can we talk about them in a more systematic way that might benefit the whole space? So here I am, I, uh, I crystallized eight because we only have half an hour today and I wanna be really mindful of everybody's time. So I'm gonna just go through these eight. Uh, there are definitely more, but you know, I'll stick around, you can ask me more. There's also a whole UX clinic going on. So um, you know, if you have more questions, you can always, uh, yeah, dive in. So without further ado, let me, let me just start. Let me start with like, what is the most common design question that we get? Um, oh, without further ado. Should, disclaimer, this, these are quick tips to get you started. They're um, not a replacement for UX process. Like I'm not saying do this instead of actually going through the process of UX design. Um, but yeah, this is a place to start. And of course these slides will be made available either directly at the Fox to Backstage um, venue list place or uh, I'll tweet them out or something like that. Okay, without further ado now. Um, by far the most frequent question, is this logo okay? I made a logo, what do you think? Is this okay? What do I need to change? Um, and my answer to that is always like, yes. <laughs> yes, it is, it's okay. Design is you know, really about making the tool make sense to people. So you know, if you wanna have a nice visual design, yes, that is part of that, but often not the most important part. Often the most important part is making something make sense to people. So, um, you know, whenever you do have a logo and a color palette and a name that you want feedback on, that's important, but it's probably not the most important thing. Having said that though, there are some great resources you can help yourselves. Like there's, there's the noun project, you know, there are color palettes that you can choose from. Like there are people where designers and communities, you know, work together and have actually done some stuff for the community that it's open to use. Um, Logo Desk is a great place for unused logos. You can go to Unsplash for images. Never forget to check for accessibility when you're thinking about color and stuff like that. Um, 
that there's a lot of resources and there's even uh, you know collections of tools. Um, I'm, I listed some of those. Uh, the last one here is a guide for, it's literally called Design for uh, Non-Designers and I think it made the rounds on Hacker News. Basically, there are resources out there use them, rely on them, they're good. You, can, you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. The more important part about thinking about logo and colors is probably you want some sense of consistency. You want to have a style guide. So as you are developing those styles, make sure it's documented and communicated to your team and the wider community so that you know it actually leads to something being used and recognized in a, in a wider way. So that's, that's kind of what I have to say about logos and colors. Um, second most, frequent asked question, most frequently asked question is, how do I improve usability? Like, let's, let's do it. Let's, I, want to do, I want to talk about usability. How do I even start? Um, and for that, like my question is just, it depends. Usability is not something, you know, it's not a binary property. It's not like you're, there is a scale and you can rank, you know, between like zero and 10 of usable. Like it's, it's always something that is very contextual, right? Like I, I have here on the right, you know, uh, NASA's like, you know, landing, like rocket landing technology is not gonna be like one big button that just says land rocket, right? It's going to be very involved depending on what the use cases are. So. Who are your users? In what context do they use your tool? You need to define and scope exactly kind of how you fit in. And based on that, then you can start thinking about usability. Um, so the first tool I, I would like to offer up is uh, just a simple value proposition tool. Um, you can use it like this, uh, a project name, right? Some project is a mobile platform for people in a neighborhood to share their tools and expertise. Very simple formula you can apply in many contexts. Another example, this project is a secure protocol for sysadmins in human rights orgs to configure remote devices. Again, super, it like, gives me a very good overview of what, what is it? You know, is it an animal, a mineral, a vegetable? What is it? And who, it is, who, it is, who is it for? And what context are they using it? Based on that then, again, I'm giving out tools today, um, create personas, create personas of the people that you're working for and really understand, get a deeper understanding of their, their needs and challenges and do just some lightweight journey mapping. No need to do like a full service design blueprint, but just sort of like what are the steps they take on this journey in interacting with your tool um, and how can you, yeah, what are the pain points that you can identify and how can you sort of like uh, fill in the gaps and the needs along the way. Um, again, lightweight things to think about. Here's another one. How do I get that user feedback, right? We talked about, you know, okay, understanding who the users are, but how do I actually get feedback to implement um, in, our, in our development process? And I think my answer there is also depends on where you put it and how you place it. I have this image here of, you know, I don't know if you've seen those before, you know, you go to a restroom and then you're asked like to rate it afterwards. And I don't think those get really good responses because nobody wants to touch buttons that other people might have touched after they went to the bathroom, right? So what, where do you place that like feedback giving moment in the process? And I think there are two main ways of approaching this. One way is to think about passively getting user feedback. And this is just looking at your GitHub issues and seeing which ones are about UX or UI, identifying them and kind of getting a feel for what people are running into. Um, talk to your technical support team if you have one. They usually have the best idea of like what's working and what's not working. Um, you can also offer a feedback form, always. You can always uh, just put it on your website and wait for things to come in. Of course, that has the major downside that this is going to be uh, there's going to be a huge selection bias, right? Like people who can come and actually file something with you are probably GitHub users already. So you have a massive selection bias. The other way to do it is to actively seek out user feedback. So talking to people, talking to real people, um, three to six, great number, don't need to go further than that. And what you should probably go further than is your community, right? Just think about like, what would it take to grab someone, maybe not someone off the street, but like grab someone who is interested in these topics, but has never seen your tool before. Like talk to someone like that and just 
you know, put something in front of them and see what they think, right? Like that's, that's also a great place to get some feedback. Um, when you do have a GitHub issue tracking flow, add a UX bug template in it, right? And, and the, the template should just be, you know, what, what are you running into and what are your expectations? Like kind of like any good bug reporting, but just make sure that you give people an, a special place to file and to also track UX bugs. Um, and finally, also a good way um, if you're not, you know, tracking any people, which nobody should be doing anyway, but like, you know, if you want to know like, oh, who are actually my users, send out a survey, right? Um, send out a survey and see who responds and uh, get some like basic demographic information about your user base. That sometimes also goes a long way. And now, okay, well, all right, Eileen, you told me about how to actually you know, talk to real people. Well, but how do I test my piece of software, right? Like there's one, there's a difference between talking to people and testing software. Testing software doesn't have to be complicated. Testing software can be anything like I'm printing out uh, my website and I'm having people highlight things that confuse them. Like in this case, uh, with a uh, project we worked with, um, Least Authorities Grid Sync, um, it was just, yeah, mark anything that is really, really confusing to you. And I love this particular example because you know we think, oh, open source transparency, unlike other client site encryption services, this is free open source software. Anyone can read the code and confirm that it doesn't have secret backdoors. And this user tester just literally circled that anyone and said, well, I can't. Not any, anyone can read the code. I can't read the code. Doesn't mean anything to me. Who cares, right? And that those are the sort of moments you really want to capture in a user testing situation. And to that end, also giving you some guidance. This is a, a video that we shot. Um, just basically have a way to interact with someone where you can be open-minded and resist the kind of urge to educate, right? Because in this sort of user testing scenario, you really have to like flip the dynamic and you have to be the learner rather than the teacher. And you have to learn from someone to really teach you about how your tool works or doesn't work um, for their context. Um, paper prototypes, super helpful. You don't, you don't even write a line of code to, to test anything. You can just literally draw it, you know, make sure the screens kind of make sense. Um, I really love using sort of like sticky notes are great. Like in this size, that's a perfect mobile screen. Um, just grab something and start drawing. Um, if you want more guidance, again, here's a small video and there's also uh, our partners, okay, thanks, have a, a guide of like, you know, just give someone a guide, uh, give someone a tour of your tool and see what they, how they deal with it or not. <laughs> um, all right, how to organize settings. Super, super frequent question because of course we love having lots of different ways to interact with a tool and having lots of options to customize. Um, my first answer is defaults. Think about how you can help your first time user by having sane defaults, having defaults that make sense to people that um, help them in some way uh, that actually, you know, is, is going to increase their, you know, security, privacy, uh, whatever values you have as a tool maker. Um, and then you can still offer them the options to, to customize. Um, of course, you know, when I think about that, I always think about, this particular video that I shot uh, in a Taiwanese bathroom, you have the, you know, all the intricacies, all the options of customizability in the background. But what you're doing is you're putting a mask in front of it to make it simple to most people's needs, right? So think about that metaphor of like, what it would mean in your particular tool to just give people some help and some guidance. Um, Help, writing, <laughs> I need to write. How do I write? Can someone help me write? Like this is a, often a real like panic moment to a lot of projects. Um, like now I actually have to write a documentation. Where do I start? Um, my kind of almost simplistic answer there is, you know, start with like the really, really like the first places um, one level at a time. Start with what is this thing? like. Again, is it an animal, a mineral, or a vegetable? Like, what is it? How does it work? 
how do I use it as a person and why should I use it? Those are the four questions you really need to answer to anybody, any reader coming to your uh, website, coming to your tool starter page, basically. Those are the four questions you really wanna answer. And I also wanna say um, the hardest part about writing is really communicating the relevant information at the right time. Um, and it's something that lots of people don't don't appreciate, you know, that basically, you know, those four types of information can also be very, very different depending on who your reader is. So I just, I just started this because I feel like that's a lot of people have that in common. Like you have like your contributor audience, you have your user audience, and then you have the quote unquote rest of the world audience. Um, those four questions are going to be very, very different, both in the format and in the tone, depending on where, you know, who your reader is and where they're reading it. So um, just to give you some examples, like what is this, you know, for the rest of the world should probably be on the level of like, explain it like I'm five, right? Like, don't don't give me um, more information that I need uh, versus, you know, a how does it work question for your contributor probably is more, you know, suitable as a spec or a white paper. Um, really think hard about like how people are going to try to understand your tool and like divide up the bits of writing in these parts. Um, writing is hard. Anybody who says writing is easy is probably not necessarily a good writer, right? Writing really takes laboring over. So um, it's okay that it's hard, but just make sure that you go one step at a time. Um, FAQs are really great to help people troubleshoot. If you want people to like look up something and you know, honestly, if you're definitely getting FAQs, um, put them in there. If you're not getting FAQs, um, don't use that as kind of a crutch to actually write stuff, right? Like they're not a replacement for good writing. Um, like I, sh I know I just showed you like, you know, these questions, but um, these questions should be a guidance to your writing. They should not actually be appear on the website because it, it's like, um, it, it's too many questions and people are, finding it hard to navigate also just you know like public service announcement like if you ever find yourself saying like go and read the fucking manual it's probably time to rethink your information architecture right it's probably a really really good indicator that people cannot find the information in a timely and relevant place so um again go back to that like menu bar and like just literally write things on like index cards and try to like sort them in a way according to context, according to audience, and see if you can make sense of it in a better way. Um, I want to say a really great way of writing is using metaphors. Um, this is an example from Tails that I brought. Uh, Tails is a live operating system that you can you know, put on a USB stick. Uh, it has this really wonderful feature of being amnesic, which means whenever you, you know, unplug it, uh, everything gets deleted, so to say, like there's nothing on it that can trace back to you. And Tails really found a wonderful way of describing something that is kind of technically a little bit more complex in a very accessible way by using this metaphor of a tent, right? It's a tent that you roll up whenever you leave, you know, the contents get, are gone. You can do lots of things in the tent, but like, once you roll up the tent that, you know, nothing should be inside. Um, and this, this sort of idea, you know, using metaphors to really explain a technology to first time users, that, that is sort of the holy grail of, of a writer. Um, and in this case, also a really good thing to illustrate. Okay, UI, <laughs> user interface, where to start? Like there is lots of stuff out there today, lots of like design tools, um, how do I, you know, how do I first, you know, implement anything to begin with? I would say start where you are. Don't, don't overthink it. Use familiar UI patterns wherever you can. Your users, thank you very much. Um, and the other thing I want to just like sneakily say, there is no copyright on design patterns, right? Like anything that you see that is a nice pattern in the wild, you can use basically. Um, and what is a design pattern? It's a sort of like, well, we'll get there in a second. But like, I wanna just show you the real quick, um, wonderful methodology here, which is, oh, this, this website has a really good layout that I like too. Maybe we should use that. And then you just literally like print it out again and trace it. And then 
next thing you do, you have you have the actual wireframe already, right? Like you can just just do that. Um, design pattern. This is from a coaching with Fab Access. They're doing uh, sort of like open source um, user management of Fab Labs and makerspaces. Um, and because they're federated, they have this wonderful feature that when you go into a space, you can use the same app to sign on to different servers, right? You can say, oh, this is this particular makerspace, so I'm gonna sign on as you know, this user in this server uh, versus you know, some other makerspace as that other user in that server. Um, they, just, they just used a very basic Wi-Fi design pattern. I don't know if you can see that, but basically you, know, you have this sort of like active connection. And then there are the other connections that are also available that you can also choose from. And the sort of idea that, well, you know, connecting to a server technically has, well, not, is, doesn't have a lot of overlap with Wi-Fi, but the mental model is super similar. And whenever you can find opportunities like that, rely on something that you can use uh, you know, over and over again um, because your users will be familiar with that pattern already. So that's just a, a tip from the UI side of things. OK, and finally, sorry for the, the, the tongue in cheekness of this, but um, how do we hire designers? What's the best way to hire designers? And this is a, this is a joke um, uh, that I should, you know, credit my fellow Simply Secure folks for. Um, how many black turtlenecks do we have to give away to get designers to work on this open source project? And I think it's a really, really hard question, and it touches on some of the structural things that we've been talking about, um, you know, these past two, three days. Uh, I would say start by asking, <laughs> start by asking. In the best case scenario, you have a designer as a user already, and they might be interested to contribute in some fashion. Um, there are lots of designers also who are working in your domain. You know, maybe your domain is, you know, Fab Labs. Maybe your domain is uh, in browser security. Like there, there are designers who are working in those domains, and you just need to kind of actively seek them out a little bit. Um, or you know, the hard part is to actually put in time to onboard designers to your project. Um, that takes a lot of time, both from you as a project, but also from designers. So it's like um, sort of a, you know, an investment on both ends. But I do want to point to this really wonderful thing that happened last year, at least in my little world. It was kind of amazing. Uh, MuseScore is a wonderful open source tool for um, jotting down music. Uh, any, you know, if you're composing, if you're arranging, if you're whatever it is, if you kind of work with sheet music, you probably have bumped into MuseCore at some point. Um, and there's this wonderful uh, YouTuber uh, who is you know, a UX designer uh, who loves to compose. And uh, his name is Martin Curie. And he did this like 20 minute takedown on MuseScore on all the things that you know, he, he saw that were problematic, that were like torturous and horrible for a designer um, on MuseScore. And, um, the way MuseScore responded and the you know, ensuing conversations that would have happened uh, actually have led to Martin being the head of design at MuseScore months later, right? So this sort of like small interactions, you know, that's exactly the sort of thing that um, we can like hope to see more of by, by having more designers using open source tools who can then like actually take on some more responsibilities. Um, Again, not, this is not, hopefully not an exception. The other good route to go is to think about how you want to have design contributions rather than just code contributions for your project. Uh, this is from Elementary OS, which is a kind of like a Mac-like Linux uh, distribution that you can use. And they don't just have, you know, how to support us as a web developer, um, as a desktop uh, developer. They also have that uh, design. Like, if you're a designer, this is how you can be part of the conversation. And so that's something I think more people can, more projects, more people can think about uh, introducing. Like, basically, what are the like things that designers can contribute to? How do you make it easy in terms of onboarding them and including them as part of the community? I should also say, 
working in open source with all of its you know ups and downs, it also means having a huge amount of variety and working on hard problems and having lots of impact, right? So designers actually, once they come in here, they're really motivated to work more on it. Like I, I listed some of the topics that I worked on just in the last two years. And I don't know if uh, I should read it, but like basically, you know, like how to design a privacy minded pre period tracker, how to teach people about in browser malware, how to reliably document human rights violations. These are all like different questions that you can touch on just by like joining an open source project. And I feel like these are the kind of things that we can, uh, you know, advocate for more also in the design circles um, that this is really, you know, once you once you kind of get over the, the first initial hur hurdle of joining an open source project, that there is actually a lot of fun um, and joy to the work that that we all do. Um, finally, I would, you know, be, be amiss if I don't point you to uh, open source design, the community of designers who have been here for years and have been saying the same things for years. Uh, they have a job board. Uh, you can find it um, at, you know, open source dot open source design.net slash jobs, um, where you can post, you know, specific asks that you might have. And this is also a place where designers can come in and maybe pick a thing up or two. Um, so that leaves me with, you know, major things to, to, to take home. Uh, talk to your users and your potential users, you know, understand the needs and pains, uh, not just of those who are currently using your tool, but hopefully who might be using your tool in the future. Um, always focus on onboarding explanations and documentation rather than just like the pretty, the logos. Um, and really help guide your users with good writing, familiar UIs, easy wayfinding, just sort of put yourself in their shoes and see what, what would happen. And the most important thing maybe, UX and UI design is a mindset, I think, rather than a craft. Um, just thinking about usability and accessibility is, is sort of a perspective, it's a lens on things. Um, applying that perspective is way more important than yeah, making things look pretty or having a logo. I think it's more important to really be able to empathize with your users. Um, I put some more design resources under simplysecure.org slash UX starter pack. There you'll find some like basics, like in terms of persona templates, uh, user testing guides, uh, value proposition tools, and more. Uh, so, you know, you're very welcome to use it. And if you ha ever have any questions, please do get back to us. I also want to point you to uh, two more talks today. I think immediately after my talk right here in Pansala Back, Balin, my fellow open source designer, will be talking about user research and why we are so scared of it. Um, Related to that, also later, Scott Jensen, a UX designer, has tried open source, but it failed. <laughs> so I really look forward to that talk. Um, I hope we'll touch on more topics about you know, the systematic issues around design and open source. And don't forget, there is a UX clinic. So please do uh, come by and you know ask us more questions that I can include in the future versions of FAQs uh, from design coachings. That's it from me. This is me. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stick around a little bit for more questions, if you have any questions. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I learned a lot, actually. Um, Great. I will try to, to put to work soon. Um, but we actually also, we had a few questions um, on our platform. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'll just uh, start with those. Um, the first question is, do you think that users could report UX problems better if uh, FOSS operating systems like Linux provided better tools to record and paste short videos and screens? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good way to get user feedback if you don't have any other solutions. But I've been saying that literally talking to people will get you better information. And this is, and I really do believe that qual qualitative information is is not to be replaced. Um, yes, you can have screen recordings and you can get more data and you can have it built in more. I, I don't think that's a bad idea, but I really do think that there is no way around actually just sitting down with a person and testing it. 
Okay, and the other question is a bit more uh, specific um, to one of the projects you talked about. Um, mm -hmm. In Tails, do they specifically research how to make the default better? Because if you start from scratch every time, um, yeah, usually on Linux systems, you have to like build up a, a convenient um, yeah, starting point for you. Um, yeah, how do they approach that? Yeah, I should say Tails, out of the many, many sort of security-minded open source projects, is one of the most user-focused um, projects, I think, and teams. They really have usability in mind, first and foremost. So when they make decisions, and you know, I'm not part of the Tails team, but my understanding is they really think hard about what the defaults are, what is the like minimum required things that people need in this particular operating system and how can we make the defaults saner than usual. Um, I work with them, especially around explaining tales to new users and also in the onboarding flow. So you can kind of see like more guidance, more explanation always helps. But yeah, the other point about sane defaults, um, I think also stands. So I hope this answers the question.